Ever dreamed of having your very own island? Just imagine having a place where you can jet off and relax on a sandy beach whenever you want. Absolute bliss. Our star for today owns what is known as the 41st largest island in the United States, and he is the sixth wealthiest person in the world. In fact, he has a massive fortune of $69.1 billion. Today, we're going to be talking about none other than Larry Ellison. Now, how did he come upon his massive fortune? What business venture did he establish that gave him billions of dollars? That's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Now, his road to financial success was not smooth sailing, but, as the age-old saying goes, there's always a rainbow after the rain. First off, let's take a look at Ellison's childhood. It was a little rough, so brace yourselves for this. He was born in New York in August of 1944 to a single mother named Florence Spellman. At just nine months of age, Larry was stricken with pneumonia, and he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle, Lillian and Louis Ellison. It was, initially, meant to be a temporary arrangement. Unfortunately, he wasn't to see his birth mother again for a few decades. Eventually, his aunt and uncle took him in as their own and adopted him while he was still very young. Larry recalls that his adoptive mother, Lillian, was warm and loving, while his adoptive father, Louis, was unsupportive, aloof, and oftentimes distant from him. Louis had reportedly made a small fortune by dabbling in Chicago real estate, but he lost his money during the Great Depression. Since then, he was not quite the same. Ellison's adoptive parents raised him in a reformed Jewish home, but he was never one to conform to any particular religion, even saying, while I think I am religious in one sense, the particular dogmas of Judaism are not dogmas I subscribe to. I don't believe that they are real. They're interesting stories. They're interesting mythology, and I certainly respect people who believe these are literally true, but I don't. I see no evidence for this stuff. He attended the South Shore High School in Chicago, and he later attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where he was a pre-med student. He was doing pretty well, even getting named as the Science Student of the Year. However, he had to withdraw from school prior to the final exams of his sophomore year because Lillian, his adoptive mother, had passed away. He spent a summer in California during his time off school, and he eventually attended the University of Chicago to take a short course studying physics and mathematics. It was during his time there that he first encountered computer design, which will play a major role in his life, as you will be seeing later on in this video. Ellison then dropped out of the university, and he headed to Berkeley, California. Over the next decade, he moved from one job to another, even landing in major companies like Wells Fargo and the Armdahl Corporation. Throughout his various jobs, he was able to pick up computer skills. When he was working at Ampex in the early 1970s, he drew influence from Edgar F. Codd's research on relational database design, which was what he used as a springboard for what later became known as Oracle. What is Oracle? Well, if you're tech-savvy and love all things computer, I bet you already know all about it, but humor me as I explain anyways. So, what is the Oracle I'm talking about? No, I don't mean someone who can give prophetic visions. Although, those people are, pretty cool. The power to tell the future, eh? Anyways, I'm talking about the Oracle that Ellison set up. Once upon a time, in 1977 to be exact, Larry Ellison founded the Software Development Laboratories, or SDL. It was really Oracle Corporation, and he co-founded it with partners Bob Miner and Ed Oates. Their capital, a mere $2,000, $1,200 came from Ellison. However, they soon changed the name of the company to fit their product offerings. Actually, they had quite a few name changes. After SDL, they renamed the company to Relational Software, Inc. in 1979, before changing to Oracle Systems Corporation in 1983, and finally settling for Oracle Corporation in 1995. Basically, Oracle sells all things computer systems related. They sell database software and tech, cloud engineered systems, enterprise software products, and lots more. Given that the company went live during the years that the computer industry was beginning to boom and gain more traction, it's safe to say that they were able to achieve much success over time. In fact, by 2018, Oracle was ranked 82nd in the 2018 Fortune 500 list of the largest United States corporations. As of 2017, CEOs in the company stand to earn over $100 million a year, while employees earn an average of $89,000. While those numbers certainly showcase pretty big paychecks, that's quite the disparity. Bloomberg reported that the CEO to employee pay ratio is 1,205 to 1. However, Oracle's massive financial success did not come without any setbacks. 
In 1990, the company had to lay off at least 10% of its overall workforce. 400 people lost their jobs because the company was losing money. It had gotten so bad that the company almost became bankrupt, and it was the result of Oracle's aggressive, quote-unquote upfront marketing strategy. The company's salespeople encouraged customers to purchase as much software as possible all at once, and they chalked up future sales during the present quarter to amplify their bonuses. It seemed pretty harmless at first until future sales failed to materialize. It appeared that the company had earned more than what they were actually able to sell, which is a big no-no. Oracle had to then restate its earnings not once, but two times, and they had to settle some lawsuits that were brought about by their inflated earnings. Yikes. Additionally, in 2000, Oracle garnered attention, admittedly not the good kind, from both the media and different companies in the computer industry. Oracle had reportedly hired private investigators to look through the trash of organizations that were involved in an antitrust trial with industry giant Microsoft. Ellison defended his company's actions, claiming that it was a public service. However, it didn't look too good, considering Microsoft was one of Oracle's biggest competitors. But, when he was asked about how he would feel if Oracle's private files were scrutinized, Ellison replied that they believed in full disclosure. However, Oracle seems to have fixed its internal business practices. As of 2020, the company has a revenue of $39.7 billion. And, as I've mentioned, the company's success led to Ellison's wealth. I mean, the guy's in the top 10 of the richest men in the world, plus he's got his very own island. Actually, Ellison gave up the helm of being Oracle's CEO after 37 years of running it, and he pledged $200 million for cancer treatment research to the University of Southern California. He joined Tesla's board in December of 2018 after purchasing 3 million Tesla shares in that year. Thanks to his massive wealth, Ellison can enjoy a life of luxury. He owns many exotic cars, like a Lexus LFA, an Audi R8, and a McLaren F1. He also owns the Rising Sun, the 12th largest yacht in the world. In terms of property, he owns a $110 million estate and over 12 structures across Malibu. On top of his accomplishments as a businessman, Ellison is also a licensed pilot. He owns several aircraft and two military jets, the former of which he uses pretty often. To top it all off, Larry owns the Indian Wells Tennis Garden Tennis Facility, and he owns the Indian Wells Masters Tournament. What has driven Ellison to reach for the stars? Well, this is what he had to say, the most important aspect of my personality as far as determining my success goes has been my questioning conventional wisdom, doubting experts, and questioning authority. While that can be painful in your relationships with your parents and teachers, it's enormously useful in life. If you've been on the internet the past few weeks, which I'm pretty sure you have, then you probably have a general idea about what went down between GameStop and Wall Street. Many hedge fund managers reported to have lost a ton of dough during the entire debacle, but that didn't stop one guy from revamping his home to turn it into an even bigger mansion. His name is Gabriel Plotkin, and I believe that in a few months' time, he's going to be living in a more spacious home with built-in tennis courts. But wait, did you know that his company lost $4.5 billion during the showdown between GameStop and Wall Street? If that happened to me, I'd probably save as much as I could. But hey, I'm no Gabriel Plotkin. So, how exactly did they lose that much money? What is Plotkin going to be doing moving forward? And how did he become a hedge fund manager with millions and millions of dollars in his bank account? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in the video up on your screen now. So click away, sit back, and relax. See you in the next video.